Any international students? Who is Tar Tarek? 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 Tarek, speak up. Are you international? Do you understand Turkish? Okay. Okay, guys. So, uh, is this second week? Yeah, I think this is the second week, right? Uh, so, in in the live connection, there are only eleven students now. Uh, since we are in Zoom, uh, you can speak up any, anyway. Uh, turn on turn on your uh, microphone, and so I'm among. Among you uh, who are in the live connection now, uh, did you make up your groups? Uh, you know, uh, anybody who is not registered uh, on the Canvas page, we have a Canvas page. Uh, let me show it to you. Canvas, yeah. Canvas page of the course, it is compulsory, mandatory to register. And I will, you know, message a uh, true canvas page i put announcements etc and every every resource for the course is in the canvas page uh, and uh, you know basically you will since this this course is uh, online and all uh, these uh, uh, elective courses are going to be online anyway even if this uh, pandemic ends uh, we'll continue on online. So, <clears throat> uh, anybody who's who has not make up the uh, the groups for homeworks, uh, you know that I give homeworks. Uh, I will uh, announce the first one today: the optical division and fluid flow. These are usually uh, simulations, and the simulations you're gonna run. And I will also show it to you on, on the live connection, how to operate the simulations, etc. Uh, you are going to, you know, uh, write up these reports for the homeworks uh, in groups. And every group uh, will uh, get a, a grade and the, every member in the grade will, will share the same, same grade. Uh, so I hope everybody has formed these groups, okay? Uh, if you haven't done so, please uh, involve in a group. If you are not able to involve in a group, that means you are going to, you know, write your uh, homeworks or reports by yourself. Okay. But uh, I strongly suggest you to uh, involve in a group so that uh, you can share the work. Okay. All right. So uh, the last week I introduced the nanoscience and nanotechnology. Uh, you can check the lecture slides over here. So the other thing is that, you know, all my uh, lectures are recorded and you can rewatch anytime asynchronously my recorded lecture lectures by going to this uh, uh, playlist on YouTube. I will also put uh, uh, recorded uh, videos on, on the UBS page, okay? You know, uh, your course has also UBS page for the, in, in our university system that I will put also recording uh, in a weekly basis uh, over here so that you can uh, watch them again after, you know, uh, live class. Okay, so. Uh, uh, I am very uh, worrying about the guys that who are not, uh, you know, uh, joining the live sessions. I think uh, last week is about, again, the same number, like 15 people. And there are 40, 40 people that were registered for this course. And only a few of them, I 
I don't know. I'm I'm sending messages through UBS, uh, also through Canvas. On Canvas, there are 36 people who had already registered. Uh, let me check. There are yeah 36 people, 35 people, and five people who has not registered for the Canvas yet. So I'm worrying about them because you know if if you guys go like this and I. Uh, I worry that they will fail the course. Okay, if if you if you know anybody, any friends that who has not registered for the converse or not receiving my messages, or receiving my messages but not uh, joining the live class, please warn them if you are able to uh, see or uh, communicate with them. Okay, so. <clears throat> And so anyway, most of you have registered for the commons and they know you know what to do. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> uh, any any comments, any questions that you want to ask? So just uh, use this uh, live classes also for chatting, you know. You might have uh, some uh, maybe questions concerning the course or forming up your groups. Uh, uh, there is one guy, I think, Mustafa. He is not in any group. And Berkay, he is not in any group. Mustafa and Berkay maybe can join in a group. We can work together, okay? All right. So let me start, uh, continue with the uh, optical tweezers. And uh, this is the subject of this uh, week. By the way, uh, I'm holding this uh, core uh, online communication with by using Zoom. And Zoom, you know, has a limited uh, uh, connection time. It gives only 40 minutes. After 40 minutes, it kicks us out, everybody. So if you in any way kicked out uh, of the uh, live connection, again, by using the same link, please uh, uh, join again immediately after you kicked out. And yeah, okay. So <clears throat> I will start with this optical tweezer. Let me start this, uh, I hope. You are able to see, right? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, what are optical tweezers? Um, well, uh, optical tweezers are one of the uh, most powerful uh, physical tool that uh, these uh, health sciences, biology people, uh, the scientists, etc., or researchers are done. Uh, I mean, by using optical tweezers, uh, the, the, it is the responsible device tool that uh, had played very, very important roles in developing this uh, genetics or playing with the DNA or, you know, you know, this genome project, human genome project, which was, I don't know where you uh, were born yet or not, uh, at the beginning of this century, like in 2001, I guess. They just, uh, uh, you know, announced that they just sold the human genome, uh, uh, and mostly they use these tools, optical tweezers, on sequencing and you know, solving the human genome, etc. About genetics, they also use these optical tweezers in the, you know, manipulating uh, biological micro systems. They can be uh, cells, uh, animals, etc. Microbes. Uh, they play uh, or manipulate, they catch them by using optical tweezers. Uh, and it's very important. So, you know, they got, uh, they receive this, this the device received the a Nobel Prize uh, just three years ago in 2018. So they're very important. And it's one of the most important tool in also nanobiotechnology. Okay. So I will introduce this uh, today's class. And what you see over here that the guy who had developed this tool, Arthur Ashkin, this is the guy that who received 
received the uh, uh, Nobel like uh, Prize. Uh, well, of course, he was alive uh, three years ago and he got the Nobel Prize, but I don't, I'm not sure uh, whether he is alive now. He is very uh, uh, old. Um, so, what is optical tweezers? And you know, uh, optical tweezers is in fact is a laser device. Okay, it's a laser device, uh, and what it does very super, uh, superficially, I'm, if I want to explain it, by using the laser light, uh, you are able to catch and manipulate and play with a small a microbiological. Uh, systems. These might be a, a cell, or it might be a, a, a single cell a creature. It might be a biomolecule like DNA, etc. You catch it, you you grab it by using light, and you play with it. You manipulate it. Okay, this is you know very superficially what it does. So, uh, but you know I will try to explain, of course, in detail uh, what it consists of, etc. And the other thing is that, you know, uh, I built uh, at this lab that I now am, I mean, uh, there is this, uh, I'm in the room of optical uh, lab in, in the uh, general physics laboratory now. Uh, I wanted to show you the setup anyway, but nah. anyway, so I will show it to you anyway, the setup. I built myself uh, an optical tweezer over here. Uh, so we, we have done some things with this optical tweezer, homemade optical tweezer, of course. There are uh, commercial optical tweezers, uh, which are very expensive, but we built over here uh, an optical tweezer homemade by using lasers, some lenses, a translation stage, a camera, etc. I will show it to you. We grabbed uh, uh, these uh, yeast cells. Yeast cells are the responsible cells that uh, uh, turns uh, milk into yogurt. Okay, myogenin. Also, uh, yeast cells of bread, and we grab them uh, one by one. We grab the human blood cells. I will show some some of the videos on this. And in most advanced labs in the world, they what they do is they grab a single uh, bio molecules like DNAs. Okay, organelles inside uh, cells they grab them they just manipulate them they you know do some operations on them etc okay so what is an optical tweezer optical tweezer i will also you know uh, in this representation i will what i will do is give a historical uh, development okay and i will first uh, present uh, some historical events uh, that shows that uh, Arthur Ashking was interested uh, by the action of light uh, from his very young age. The guy that uh, discovered the optical tweezer, he built optical tweezer. I will uh, go through its, uh, his interest. Um, so in fact, uh, the main uh, motive behind this optical tweezer is the invention of laser light. You know, the invention of laser light is around like 60, 1960s. Not very old, not very uh, uh, old that, uh, you know, what is 27, 20, so it's like um, 60 years ago. All right, so it was the invention of laser that changed the ground for every uh, kind of research in science, okay? Because, you know, lasers are very, very important tools. They are used in, in many branches even they, you, you use them in your daily life. Like uh, there are lasers in your computers that they, you know, are reading and writing on optical disks. And there are lasers that are used in cameras, especially for night vision, etc. There are lasers which are operated on uh, automatic doors. Okay. And there are lasers that scans your products when you buy some uh, uh, products in, in shops, etc. Uh, and you know you can you can see the lasers in every uh, part in your life if you're new. So lasers are very important. Uh, and you know these optical tweezers are uh, very much uh, 
you know, ignited the discovery by lasers. Well, Arthur Eschking was, you know, interested in lasers, but, you know, he, he was, of course, uh, not aware of uh, the phenomenon, which is, uh, which is the optical trapping, okay? So what is optical trapping? Optical trapping is a phenomena that in physics, by using light, a condensed light or focused light, you are able to trap, you are able to catch objects, small objects, like as small as like micron size, okay? Uh, this uh, trapping is, trapping idea is developed, okay? Uh, and, you know, I will talk about the early days of optical trapping of light pressure, uh, the origin of laser trapping, optical levitation, and then I will discuss the work that was recognized by the Nobel Committee, uh, optical tweezers, laser trapping of uh, biological particles, and then biological application of optical tweezers, okay? All right, so uh, what is this? What you see over here is Crookes radiometer is kind of uh, old device. Uh, Arthur Ashkin was fascinated by this Crookes radiometer. Uh, so a Crookes radiometer looks like this, okay? There is this uh, uh, like uh, a light bulb glass and containing these leaves, four leaves inside, and which are connected through this axis and they're able to rotate, okay? Uh, these leaves like uh, square plates, okay? One side of these uh, plates are uh, uh, black and the other side is shiny, like uh, silver color. And, you know, uh, also uh, the, this glass chamber, the air in this glass chamber is somewhat evacuated. It's not like a, a perfect vacuum, but uh, there is some air molecules, but it's pressure is very low inside. Okay, this is known as the Krug radiometer and Arthur, Ash Arthur Ashkin was very interested in, on this device. There are these four veins, okay? These, these are the veins. These uh, leaves, like uh, metal leaves are called veins. And this uh, stick right on the axis is uh, called pinwheel. And as I said, these leaves are veins are able to rotate. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> I like uh, these uh, veins like to act as a mirror and all of that was, you know, within this glass bulb with uh, some partial vacuum, as I said. When the light uh, shines on it, this is the uh, top view, this is the side view. When you look at from top, this is what you see. R right at the center, you see this um, uh, axis, the rod that keeps these veins. And, and these veins are able to rotate. When you shine light from, let's say, this, uh, from this side, okay, what happens? When you shine light on it, and the black side starts to move away from the light. So you see this, 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 this is the black side and S stands for the silver side. So you see that every vein or every plate has black side and the silver side. So when you shine light on it, what happens is that, uh, you know, this uh, veins start rotating in this direction. Okay, so, so what's, what's going on, okay? They all start in the clockwise direction. So the Crookes uh, uh, radiometer is moving due to thermal effects, okay? And if you are, you know, uh, curious about why this happens, why this rotation happens, is that uh, the Crookes radiometer is rotating due to thermal effects. And we'll explain this. Uh, in 1944, when Ashking was only 22 years ago, two to the 22 years old, he was uh, working on this uh, post magnetron. Did I? Okay. The magnetron was uh, like was mentioned earlier. It was at a Columbia Radiation Lab. He was at Columbia Radiation Lab. So he decided one day to shine his magnetron to the diaphragm uh, of the diaphragm of a phone. Like you know, every phone has diaphragm on it through this diaphragm that uh, this uh, 
uh, electrical signals is producing some uh, pressure and in this way you can convert the voice the sound into electrical signals so, so you're able to uh, communicate uh, with the phone so it's one phone ERP ERP is over here okay if you you know uh, just uh, shine uh, uh, radio light through this uh, magnetron over the diaphragm okay diaphragm uh, from uh, ear prison magnetron was operating at like uh, one kilohertz and he saw one kilo trace uh, on the scoop at the time he thought it could be a radiation pressure okay so if you shine uh, the uh, light which is which has the uh, wavelength of uh, in the in the range of uh, radio waves this is this is the magnetron when you shine it uh, uh, so there is this pressure on the diagram diaphragm and the so uh, arthur asking just interpret this observation possibly the effect of radiation pressure okay and in 1966 a few years uh, after the lasers was invented as i said in like early 60s 1960s the laser was invented and uh, laser was invented and demonstrated uh, asking went to a conference in phoenix arizona okay uh, sorry oops uh, so uh, what you see over here is that uh, he saw a video by rosin and in the video uh, so now you see, you will see the particle inside the laser. Let me run it again. Okay. Uh, laser in the internal beam of the laser, there are these there are these particles that are trapped. Okay, what what you see over here? Uh, what you see over here? This is the rays of laser light, and this is a mirror. This is a curved mirror, uh, and. Uh, let me uh, stop here. Okay, this is a kind of uh, a, a, a resonator. Resonator means that there are two mirrors facing each other, and this mirror is partially reflective. And if you shine laser through this mirror, what you do is you trap the uh, light, laser light, by going uh, back and forth between these two mirrors. And he was able, he's, he, he, he's just uh, seeing that, that some particles, when they just cross with this uh, beam, this is the beam of light, okay, parallel beam of light, but uh, parallelity becomes uh, conical at interface of this uh, uh, mirror anyway. So he saw that the, some of the particles are just uh, trapped inside this beam, okay. And when you to start the move, uh, movie in a straight line and bounces again, asking Arthur asking suggested that this could be a few different things because of uh, some of the things. So he was trying to explain what happens to these particles. Why are they are trapped uh, when they cross with the uh, laser light? Okay. One was the he was thinking that it, maybe it was the light pressure, and the other was uh, one. Uh, was the thermal effects. So asking uh, calculated what the light pressure will do and he figured out that it could not be a light pressure. So after a few months, after a few months, uh, everybody settled to say that it is thermal effect. But the main impact of this video on Arthur Ashkin is to reignite his interest in light pressure, okay? All right, so what you see in this uh, animation that, so let's consider, let's consider two different types of objects, a metallic mirror that is highly reflective, this one, okay, uh, highly reflected on this side, you see, <clears throat> and transparent uh, small sphere uh, so there you see a transparent small sphere. When a photon comes and hit a mirror, concentrate on this part. When a photon comes and hit a mirror, 
And of course, the photon is, you know, a small particle of light. And, you know, when hits on shiny surfaces, what it does is just bounces back, right? Because when you shine a, a shiny surface via light, what you see, it's, it shines back. So uh, be because of this collision of the uh, photons with this shiny surface, uh, this collision, what it does is that, in fact, uh, produces a pressure on this mirror and the mirror moves, all right? So if you think about it, it's like uh, what uh, order of the light pressure on, on the mirror, it's going to be like uh, 10 to minus 8 newtons, very small because, you know, uh, photons are very small and they carry some energy, they carry some momentum, but, you know, in compared to daily uh, objects, uh, the amount of this momentum is very, very small, okay? <clears throat> but, you know, uh, if you do the similar thing, uh, you know, if you do the similar thing by using, again, a laser light, let me go back over here. If you shine this time, not a mirror, but a, a small object, a, let's say a spherical object, but it's a transparent object, like a plastic object or a glass object, but it is very small. It's, it's a, a size is mi one micron, maybe diameter is one micron, okay? If you shine a, a laser beam on this, what uh, uh, becomes these, you know, uh, flow of photons go through when they are go, going through this uh, uh, bed, let's say, transparent bed, is this. Okay, let me show it again. So photon, for example, one photon comes, but since the bed is transparent, the, the bed is transparent, what uh, is going on is that this photon goes through the bed, but since uh, it is diffracted, it is diffracted by the bed so that the photon changes its, its direction of motion, okay? Initially, it's, it's going uh, just in this direction, but when it's just going through the bed, it changes its direction and it's going in downward direction somewhat. Uh, but since because of the change in the momentum of the uh, photon, uh, the opposite change in the momentum must occur on the bed. So the bed move must move in the upward direction somewhat, okay? And well, this can be explained very uh, easily by using the uh, concept of momentum, right? Uh, because the momentum is conserved in all kinds of interactions. So what happens is that, but even the photons have no mass, but they carry some momentum. But somewhat, if you just change the momentum of, you know, if you change the momentum of photons, uh, these change in the momentum, whatever it causes, must act upon the object. So the object moves in the opposite direction while the photons was going on the downward direction, the object will move in the somewhat upward direction. So it's kind of, you know, a similar, uh, like you can see that uh, maybe the pressure, but it's not pressure. In fact, it is the uh, uh, momentum, conservation of momentum process. Uh, well, uh, the same similar uh, impact on this uh, flat mirror is also can be explained by uh, the conservation of momentum concept because originally the, uh, the photons were coming on and they just hit the surface and they just, change their momentum just backwards. So when they change in the momentum in the backward direction for the photon, the similar change for the mirror must be in the forward direction in order to conserve the momentum. You know, this can be explained by this way, the conservation of momentum. But the thing is, while the pressure is in the order of 10 to minus eight Newtons, over here, this force, the order of force, which occurs on the small bed is like 100,000 uh, times of that of gravity. Whatever the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, gravity acting, uh, you know, 
the gravitational force acting on this bed, it is going to be uh, like many, many, many times that of the weight of the uh, bed uh, occurs as a force uh, as a result of this change of the momentum of the laser light, laser photons go through it diffracted in the way. This is called diffraction. Whenever the, uh, whenever the direction of the ch uh, light that changes upon interaction with some uh, uh, objects, this is called diffraction. Okay, if the photons were, were absorbed, these the processes were called absorption, but this process is just changing the direction of motion of the photons is explained by the process of diffraction, okay? So uh, for a one watt of laser, this, uh, as I said, uh, is, is tremendous amount of uh, force. So this force uh, can easily change uh, the motion of the objects that as as large as one micro, but one way uh, one one thing is very important over here is that these objects must be transparent. For example, this cannot be you cannot do this uh, diffraction experiment by using metal particles. These must be like dielectric particles. Dielectric means they can transfer uh, trans um, you know if, if you have any sh line shine on it. Shot can uh, just, uh, sorry, light can transform, light can go through these objects, okay? So we have six minutes for, for the end. After six minutes, I will just uh, quit and then uh, start the, uh, continue my presentation, okay? All right, so what's next? All right, when you have two photons, let me loop again. When you have two photons going symmetrically located, the small sphere will go forward for a power of one watt on, on one micron uh, sphere. The acceleration can induce on the sphere uh, is on the order of, as I said, uh, 100,000 times the force of gravity. So the radiation pressure in some of that appeared or this uh, diffraction pressure that appear to be very small on a very small object like transparent sphere. So uh, can be, you can produce tremendous accelerations, okay? All right, so now let's consider what happened in this sphere uh, is not exactly on the axis of the laser. What you see over here is that you, you see a sphere which is not on, on the axis of the laser. So this is the laser light beam and the sphere is inside, but not it is not located exactly on, on the center of the beam, okay? So what happens? So the laser, of course, high in, there is this high intensity region, which is close to the axis. In, in fact, what you see on over here is distribution of the power of the laser beam. So the power goes very high in the optical axis, in the near, in the region near the optical axis, but you know it becomes uh, lower when you go away from the axis. Okay, all right. So uh, when we saw what we saw in previous animation, if a photon arrive, arrive, and upper part of the sphere, it's you know good, it will be deflected. It will be a force on the sphere if the photon arrived at the lower part, uh, the force in the other direction of the sphere, okay? So what you see is that there is going to be more photons that go through in the upper part of the sphere and they will be deflected downward. There will be also photons going uh, through the lower part of the sphere. They will be uh, deflected in this direction, but the number of photons that uh, they will uh, deflect in this direction is, is going to be more because this part of the beam is having higher number of photons. And as, as a result, the, the uh, bed, this transparent object, will have a net force which is acting upon towards the center of the beam. So it's kind of this bed, this sphere, will be attracted to a region of the laser beam which has more power. Okay, as I said, 
uh, the laser beam has the most of its power in in the center of the in the around the optical axis so whenever have whenever you have these spheres like this which are off the optical axis they will somehow 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 be attracted toward the higher intensity region in the laser beam okay so this is what we call is that the optical trapping is occurring so if 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 you consider this case that the uh, you know the sphere was in this somewhere in this region in this region the similar uh, process will take the sphere toward the region of high intensity toward the optical axis okay so whenever you put in this uh, beam profile whenever you put, wherever you put this sphere all spheres they will be somehow acted upon these forces and they will be always pulled toward the center so they will be trapped okay this is how uh, is that the optical trapping occurs okay so this is somewhat the explanation that uh, the asking was uh, calculated also explained that you know this force of course there are other forces that you know keeps uh, the sphere uh, moving in this direction in the direction of the laser and these are going to be named as the radiation pressure but the force that like the pulls or attract the sphere toward the uh, center of the beam is called the gradient force so it's kind of there are uh, two different kinds of forces interplaying with each other or you know going against with each other one is the gradient force that pulls the sphere toward the center of the beam the other is that the uh, scattering force or the pressure the radiation pressure that moves the sphere along the axis okay so we have only one minute uh, left so i will uh, stop here and i will just uh, uh, end the uh, uh, live class and i will uh, start again right after i and the meeting. Okay, so please connect again. Okay, I will stop here for the second part of the uh, presentation.